My name is Meena Kaluri, and I'm the medical director of the multidisciplinary collaborative ILD clinic at the University of Alberta. I think when patients are dealt with this diagnosis, it's a, it's a tumultuous time in terms of emotions. Um, so one of the questions that I often get asked is about prognosis. You know, how much time do I have to talk kind of thing. And lots of patients these days are doing their research, they're reading things online, and they often come back with um, statistics like the survival in IPF is two years, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's two to five, three to five. You'll find different statistics online. Uh, now, statistics should always be interpreted in context. So I always tell my patients that that's just an average from a population data, meaning lots of patients were studied and they figure out an average from that. So those statistics are not you. You are your own individual person and your course may be very, very different. Unfortunately, we don't have tools at our disposal that help us uh, predict a timeline, like telling you a six month time frame or a six week time frame or a six year time frame. Unfortunately, we don't have the right kind of tools in terms of uh, your breathing tests. I can't just look at your breathing tests or just your CT scan or, or even just your symptoms, but they can give me a good indication of what's um, in, in store. So we can use a combination of these things and give you an estimate, but I'll tell you more often, um, patients have surprised me. So when, pa when patients come in and they're asking about prognosis, this is what I tell them. It's good to be informed, it's good to read statistics, but don't be discouraged by it. And remember that you are your own person and your experience, your disease experience can be very, very different. Uh, you might exceed what, what was predicted by those statistics, three, four years. I have seen patients live far longer than that. But I've also seen patients who, who succumb to their disease earlier than that. So it's very, very individualized. The second thing I would say is uh, the best way is to have an open attitude an accepting attitude. I find that the patients who accept their diagnosis are then able to move on to the next stage, which is what can I do? Focusing on what can I do with this now? And I think once you change your attitude and you become um, focused on the present and dealing with the present, your outcomes are going to be much, much better than someone who's still struggling with the acceptance of the disease phase. It's the hardest thing to do, but once you cross that bridge, then the real healing can begin in so many ways, you can start to empower yourselves about how to live um, well and cope well with this condition and move on with it because we can't, uh, we can't afford to get stuck in the initial phase. Having an open attitude, a uh, positive attitude uh, will change perspective, whether it's for treatments or oxygen or transplant or even end of life. Perspective matters. So the world is as you perceive it. So you can change your world by changing your perception. So I, I find that patients who are able to adopt that kind of a positive attitude do the best, no matter what their disease is. Yep, so prednisone is a steroid. And in general, we say that IPF is a non-inflammatory condition, meaning it's a fibrosis or a fibrosing condition. So in general, we don't use prednisone for long-term therapy of IPF, but in certain situations we, we do and we can prescribe uh, steroids. So one of those examples would be if you've had a flare of your underlying IPF. To control the acute flare of your IPF, your physicians might put you on a, short, on a course of steroids. The other reason, sometimes if you have cough, low dose prednisone sometimes can be used or if prednisone is used for other purposes. But in general, we don't put patients on long-term courses of steroids if they have IPF. So that is a controversial question uh, and the guidelines um, addressed it, but they provided um, very low quality evidence. So the, initially the guidelines said, yes, it may not be unreasonable to consider treatment for asymptomatic reflux, but the research to date does not show significant benefit in terms of um, either treating your cough or changing your long-term disease course with treating asymptomatic reflux, but I think uh, future research that will hopefully be done and published will uh, help inform that decision. What I do is generally start with non-pharmaceutical approaches. So things like identifying your triggers, modifying your diet, perhaps losing weight, 
trying not to eat a large meal three hours before your sleep time, um, not going to a reclining position as soon as you've had a meal, even for a nap in the afternoon, and raising the head end of your bed by at least six inches. All of these strategies work better, so you might want to consider discussing these and trialing these out. So there are different ways of looking at it. Um, as far as medications are concerned, we, we try and think of the disease as being mild, moderate, or severe, and that depends on where your FVC is. It's one of those numbers we look at when you're doing your breathing tests. It's called the forced vital capacity. And um, most countries, most states, most provinces within Canada, they think of 50 to 80% as being mild to moderate. So if you're above 80% in your FEC, you could, you're considered to have mild disease. If you're 50 to 80%, you have moderate disease. Anything less than 50% would then be considered severe. But that's only based on one particular number. We have to look at a lot more than just uh, those numbers on a breathing test. I would say another way to look at IPF and trying to understand where you are and in your own disease journey is to understand with respect to oxygen, right? So if you've not started oxygen, you've not qualified for oxygen, you might be in the early phases. Uh, once you figure out that your oxygen numbers are going low on a six minute walk test, that's mostly a progressive sign of a progressive disease. And maybe once you switch from low flow oxygen to high flow oxygen, anything more than four or five liters of oxygen, I would call that uh, maybe a more advanced phase because after that disease starts to progress. So one way of looking at uh, progression and to figure out where you are in your own process, it's are you on oxygen? How much oxygen? Are you on high flow oxygen? Might be another way to figure that out. There isn't a, a specific kind of staging, uh, so to speak, but in general with IPF, we don't really categorize it like that. So mycophenolate is one of those uh, drugs I think we very briefly spoke about in the beginning. It's an immunosuppressive drug. In other words, it's used in some cases of pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung diseases, where we also believe that inflammation is a big part, not just scarring, but inflammation. Just like IPF is just mostly scar, not so much inflammation. So we don't use these um, drugs. But if you have other types of pulmonary fibrosis, which are not IPF, for example, you have rheumatoid arthritis, you have scleroderma, you have hypersensitivity pneumonitis. These are all types of pulmonary fibrosis. We might consider using an immunosuppressive drug to keep that inflammation down. So the hope is if the inflammation is down, it's not gonna trigger more scarring in the lung. So we might use many of these medications, sometimes alone, sometimes in a combination, to prevent inflammation, hopefully to reduce scar formation in the lungs. Diagnosed early and correctly so that you know which type of pulmonary fibrosis you have. Do you have the type that actually requires steroids and immunosuppressive drugs, or do you have the type that actually requires antifibrotics, like the IPF type? So it's very important to know that difference very, very, very clearly. So I think this is also one of those questions, hopefully that future uh, research will address. But for now, uh, most of the experts around the world believe that oxygen should be started. If on a walk test, you're measuring your oxygen numbers and your numbers are below 88% and you have some symptoms, like you have shortness of breath, you have cough, you have fatigue, you're struggling with activities. If you have those two things, then it's probably not a bad idea to trial oxygen and see if it benefits you. Now in a lot of provinces, maybe other countries in the world, it's approved at that point. But in Alberta, it's not approved. So in other words, if you have symptoms and your oxygen levels are going below 88%, you might um, self-fund oxygen, do a small trial and see, rent a portable concentrator and see if it makes a difference. If it helps your symptoms, it helps your activities, it helps your quality of life, then I would say discuss it with your physicians if you've not already done so. And you might want to advocate for yourself, try and see if you can get the oxygen funded. If not, paying out of pocket or finding uh, some other grants to support that would be useful. So specific oxygen number, less than 88%, plus you have symptoms and poor quality of life. I would say that's a point to consider oxygen and discuss it. 
So biologics are a specific type of uh, medications, mostly used with a lot of these autoimmune conditions. In other words, if there's inflammation in your body, whether that, that inflammation is happening from uh, underlying autoimmune diseases like scleroderma or rheumatoid arthritis. So in that, it, it's in that world, it's in that context that biologics are used quite a bit in, in the ILD world. So yes, if you have any of those conditions and there is evidence that there is progression either of the lung uh, problems that you have from that disease or other issues like joint problems, skin problems, muscle problems. If there is evidence of progression, then absolutely those drugs can be added. Ones that are already on can be changed or escalated up. Um, and that decision is taken uh, in a discussion between the lung doctors and your rheumatologist along with you and your family and then the decisions are made. So absolutely there is room to change to add.